Welcome back to Unlocked, guys. I'm so excited because I have Aaron Singerman with me today. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for having me on of the show, course, Savannah. Of course. Y'all, he's going to act like this is his first time, so bear I'm with me. I'm not going to act like it's my first time. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. So, Redcon 1. Yes. It's funny because, and now everyone that I've spoken to knows what Redcon 1 is. Uh-huh. I was just out of the loop. I met you, and then I became familiar with yes. Redcon 1. Now, now you know. Now you know it all. Yeah. So yeah. what? tell us what Redcon 1 is. Uh, Redcon 1 is my uh, sports supplement company. So we sell everything from like protein powder to creatine, ready to drink drinks, okay. canned energy now, and uh, and also gyms. So Redcon 1 gyms, I have two, one here in Nashville, and then mm-hmm. one in Boca Raton, Florida. And Redcon 1, the, the, the actual business is based in Boca Raton, but I also have warehouses and offices here in Nashville. And uh, we're sold in all over the place from Walmart to GNC and Vitamin Shop and 100 countries worldwide, Amazon and the mil- United States military, Dick Sporting Goods, all, everywhere. That's awesome. Yeah. I will say that's one thing that I loved because you had sent. I sent you a lot. A ton of stuff to my house. I got home and there was like eight boxes yeah. full of stuff. And I saw on the back of one of the cans, mm-hmm. what is like your initiative with the military? So, yeah. So what Redcon 1 means from the very beginning, Redcon 1 is a military uh, lingo or jargon. This means the highest state of military preparedness or military readiness. Okay. And I love that for a name because it... it it really works for everybody. Yeah. Whether you're, you know, a soccer mom or a Navy SEAL or a bodybuilder, who doesn't want to be at the highest state of readiness? So yeah. it really, it really applied for everybody. But the idea of the brand has always been um, from the very beginning to support the United States military. Uh, we're very pro-military, pro-America, very patriotic company. And so one of the things that we've always done is uh, donate to good causes. And I own a, a run at foundation called the Redcon One Foundation that makes a difference in a military a service member or the family of service members, Gold Star family, as we lost somebody in combat. Um, we do something to try to make a difference in the lives of, uh, of one of these individuals or their families every month. But also we donate to all kinds of different military causes. And so the Gary Sinise Foundation is what we're doing currently with Canned Energy. So for okay. every, every can we sell, a nickel of the can, which sounds like not that much, but ends up being a lot. It's a lot. Um, gets donated to that particular foundation. And that's amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's always been a priority uh, of, of mine and of the brand. Uh, when you start uh, any kind of company, you need to have a differentiating factor. Yeah. I think, I think when you build a business, there needs to be something different about you. Or why would they buy Red mm-hmm. Can One? Why would you support my brand over somebody else's if there's a, a million to choose from? Exactly. Yeah. So, what? how did it come about? How did it come about? So I've been in the bodybuilding and fitness industry uh, since uh, my late twenties. Okay. And um, I uh, I love bodybuilding and fitness, and I, I decided to follow my passion in by basically doing bodybuilding, but being a tall, skinny guy by nature, I didn't have like the genetics to be a, a, a pro bodybuilder, be Mr. Olympia, which is a, you know, in, in retrospect, you really don't make any money as a pro bodybuilder. Yeah. We talked about this. There's not a lot of money in this, but I thought, you know, there's probably other things I could do surrounding the world of bodybuilding and fitness yeah. that would make some money. And Cause so, you were very much into business. Like from yeah. a very young age, yes. you were like, wanted to be successful. I'm, I'm, I am, I naturally have an entrepreneurial spirit for yeah. sure. Like I've always been, even when I like have casual conversations me you talk about something or whatever sitting down talking i like my business mind it happens like automatically even when it's like not not necessarily appropriate i'm starting to think of like the the angles or the what, for sure yeah and that's always been like that um but i was very distracted as a young man you know i did uh, drugs i had a real bad drug problem for my younger years really from the time that i was like out, right out of high school till the time i was at, like late late 20s 27 yeah. till i really got off of drugs and when i got off of drugs um, I realized that, you know, I didn't have uh, a lot of things that I really loved because I try to figure out like, you know, that you always hear, you know, if you find your passion, you never work a day in your life or that, all this yeah. stuff. And I wanted to do something like that. And all I could think of that I was passionate about was bodybuilding, but I'm not going to be a pro bodybuilder. It's not just not in the cards. So finding something that made sense that I was able to take all of my uh, energy and effort and put into I was very lucky to have one thing because most people, it's tough to even think of one thing, you know? So I put everything that I had, like the kind of obsessive compulsive person that I am into figuring out what that thing is and making money doing it. And, uh, and that led me to the world of uh, kind of journalism of bodybuilding and fitness, where I okay. covered bodybuilding and fitness. Um, I first started with a podcast that was very popular. No this way. Is not, this actually is not my first time. 
Um, I was being an asshole. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so I had a podcast and it got really popular and it led me to another opportunity to actually go around the world interviewing people for, for bodybuilding fitness. No way. Yeah. So I would I'd travel literally all over the place to go to bodybuilding shows and fitness conventions and expos to interview people. And I would, you know, be out there and literally, you know, with a, with a microphone interviewing the winners of contests or fitness celebrities. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I would actually, especially in the beginning, I would edit my own videos. I would put them up onto the website that I worked for, a company called RX Muscle. No way. Yeah. I'm learning all new I things. Know, I'm teaching you. I'm giving you the whole story of the background. Thank God. Yeah. So um, at So you weren't always Muscle, difficult. I wasn't always difficult. You weren't always difficult. You I've like always actually. Kind of, I've always been kind of a little difficult. Okay. All right. I was giving you the benefit of the doubt. Continue. <laughs> so I uh, I worked for this company, RX Muscle, and I, I worked my butt off, and eventually I became the editor and the chief of the site. Okay. And it was a multimedia bodybuilding fitness website. And so I became the, the top guy of the site. During that period of time, I got married and uh, got pregnant. My wife got pregnant. And uh, and I realized that I was not going to be able to provide for a family mm. um, doing this. Because even though I, was, I loved what I was doing, I was making like $65,000 a year, something yeah. like that. And I was like, you know, even though that like, what a great thing to make money and pay your bills doing what you love, it's not going to be enough. And so I started really hustling um, and I turned on that entrepreneurial spirit like 100 percent and focused uh, that obsessiveness instead of like I did to get into the world of bodybuilding. I used that to figure out how to make money. Yeah. And I realized I had like uh, like I'm really good at making money. And uh, it's the truth. You, you can sell That's just it. about anything. It's the truth. So I started um, right there in the beginning selling advertising for that same site and I was getting 10 percent commission. So quickly I was making a few hundred thousand dollars. Uh, on top of the the salary, just selling advertising. Wow! And then uh, and then I started doing marketing and helping supplement companies um, sell their products better. And so it okay. ended up being where I went from making sixty five thousand to about a million bucks a year very very quickly, like um, wow. out of out of just out of desperation to figure out how to. How to, how, provide, to, how to provide. How to provide. And, and, and I realized I really liked it. Like, but I you also it. set yourself to a very high standard. Yes. Like, I feel like you are very much a performer. Yeah. And that's where, like, we have that in yeah. common that not that you're not grateful, but enough is never enough. Like, no. you can always do better. Oh, yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. I think, look, it's, it's one thing to be to be, like, proud and grateful. It's another thing to be satisfied. And if you're satisfied, that means mm -hmm. you're you're. You're done. There's no more. You're good. You're good where you're at. And, yeah. and I think that if you um, if you really want to re reach a kind of um, if you're ever going to reach an extreme level of success, the the being satisfied can't be a thing. Yeah. Um, so, no, it's like a, but I feel like that's almost like a genetic component. Some people have that. Some people don't. One you know? hundred percent. I had a great sales guy that worked for me for a while back in a different business. Really great guy. And he was making twelve thousand dollars a month selling. And I remember we had a conversation because he stopped like progressing. Yeah. And I sat down with him. And I said, hey, man, like what's going on? And he said, I'm doing really good. I'm making twelve thousand dollars a month. And I was like, uh-huh. Yeah. You, you, you really came out of nowhere and started kicking butt. But like now what? And he's yeah. like, no, this is really all that I that I need to to be OK. Like, I'm good with this. Mm. And I said, all right. So this is a warning. If you continue to stay, get twelve thousand dollars a month, you're not going to stay here anymore. And he was like, what? And he kind of stayed around and I'm firing him. Um, wow. Because you can't, you can't be okay. Like you can't work for me and just be like, I'm good with this. I don't need any more. Not if you're a sales guy anyway. Well, and too though, I feel like you also make that very clear at the beginning. Oh yeah. 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 Well, so there's no, there's no surprises. No, no we can't. Like, if you're, if you're uh, working, if you have a goal like that, a job that's goal oriented and you hit the number, yeah. the number has to move, right? The bar mm -hmm. has to go further. It can't be like, well, that, that's it. For sure. Um, so for me in my life, my bar is always moving. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, and that could be, that could be something where I'm really number based. I'm like super motivated by numbers. Um, but the numbers, a lot of times it's just almost like a, a scoreboard that I'm keeping track of them because how else are you going to, how what would, the, what would the barometer be if you don't have an, a number or a goal? Yeah. So I'm super duper goal oriented and I'm also moving the, the bar all the time. Okay. Oh. So now we look at your life. Mm hmm for all intents is like all intents what is it intents all, and purposes yeah, yeah. what yeah finish my sentence for all um, intents and purposes your life is like this picture perfect life <laughs> married kids <laughs> oh you mean right then when it, I, right, I, I in that time money. okay yeah okay, no yeah. not now i know why you laugh God. now because yeah. everything life's still good i gotta say like i don't want it life is really good right now but well, yes there's yes, been a lot of I'm drama saying, there's been some stuff. <laughs> the American dream of a life. Yeah. It's like married, kids, successful business. I mean, making great money. 
everything's going great until well it was going great for a while so um right around that period of time 2012 i started a company called blackstone Labs. so instead of making uh helping people drive demand for their business and sell supplements i realized if i can do this for all these brands why don't i do my own brand yeah and so me and my best friend and a guy named pj braun uh, joined together i had the the i basically created this thing and i said i want to do it with my best friend mm-hmm. which in retrospect you know uh i would tell people out there and i do tell people this a lot when you start a business make sure you have a business partner that's providing real value instead of just saying like it's such a good idea uh, me and your best friends i want to work together yeah but then you're like wait this person is not providing value and like resentment what did, what builds I, yeah what did i do this yeah. for right why did i do it and so when if you get a business partner and you see somebody who's either providing money or value and you have to have separate roles mm-hmm. so anyway I started this company with him in 2012 and it got really popular really fast. We were the 27th fastest growing privately owned company in the Inc. 500 and wow. number, number one in health and uh, making sports supplements, kind of like what we're doing now. The difference is it was more like bodybuilder centric. Okay. Um, people who wanted to, to get an edge but didn't want to break the law. Yeah. And some of the products we made were called pro hormones. And okay. what those are, are basically kind of steroid like compounds that aren't actual steroids. And you're, when you take it in your body, your body kind of converts them into a steroid like compound. Mm-hmm. So real popular with it, with pretty much any gym dude who wants to you know get big. And we also made pre-workout and protein and all the other different kind of products as well. But it was a very edgy company. Um, and that's where we were in life at the time. Yeah. We, you know, it was a much different time. I was, uh, 32 and we had, you were young. You know, I was in the bodybuilding industry and yeah. so that was, that was the kind of brand we created. And that kind of brand is cool, but it's very niche. Yeah. So you I only reach. Kind of, oh, you, there's only how many people really want that. Exactly. Um, like, you know, the, the, the look that these guys are going for, you, you say is very unattractive. Yes. It's very <laughs> unattractive. Like it. Grayson like is all obsessed with these bodybuilders oh, yeah. now. And I'm like, you can't even walk straight because you're so big. Yes. Like clothes don't fit you. You look right. like just like a Ninja Turtle. Like I love the Ninja Turtle analogy. Yeah. The belly with the abs. Literally. Yeah. And I'm like this. It's not attractive. So you really do. And to, that's Nish. my own personal preference. Not to hate on anyone. But you really only cater to a certain pigeonhole group yourself. of people. Yeah. Pigeonhole yourself into a, into a small group of people. Whereas like Red Cohen, like I said, uh, we have... Soccer moms who love Red Kai One, who drink the drinks. I want the canned energy and the protein, the ready to drink protein to be all over the, everywhere in the world. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I know. Thank you. I love it. Thank you. You so, may have converted me from one brand you to Red Kai One. I better have. I'm very insulted otherwise. Um, <laughs> so um, the supplement that you had, yes. it, it was a, did it sell really well? Yes. Yes. So we, the, that type of supplement called uh, Pro Hormones were totally legal. Everything was cool. Um, I sold those until, uh, so there was a law that changed in 2014, December 14th, 2014, called the Designer Steroid Control Act of 2014. Okay. And it got signed into law really rapidly um, where it had, they tried to do it in 2012 and it failed. Okay. And so I just figured, we figured it's not going to work again. Nobody cares. It's not like a big deal. Yeah. But like there's no, like these type of products, nobody was being injured or dying. It wasn't like, like Oxycontin or something like yeah. that. Right. So, um, it happened quickly and it became illegal. So there was a list of 25 compounds on this law. And of the, uh, we had six products that are like this, that are pro hormone like products. Mm-hmm. Four of them were on the list and we immediately discontinued them. We, we, stopped production of them. We um, actually d- sent out an email to all the customers. We had a memo that all the employees signed explaining like these are not OK. We got a legal opinion from a lawyer um, asking about the other two because they were similar. And the law was very iffy because it, did, it, made, it, it made it sound like anything could be added at any time. Yeah. So we just thought like these are pretty similar. Maybe they'll be added. Maybe they won't. And the lawyer said, look, don't keep a lot of inventory of them. They could become illegal at any time. Mm. We said, all right. So we discontinued the four. We had two that were kept, were kept going. In 2015, we discontinued those two as well because we got sued by a, uh, another brand who said it's called the Lanham Act case where it's illegal competition. And they said that those products were hurting their sales and they weren't legal products. So we ended up discontinuing those those products okay. um, in 2015. And, um, and then I left the business in 2016. I had this huge partnership dispute. So um, with my best friend. Um, That's always the worst. Yeah, my best friend. And then we had an investor in the company who came in at late 
who offered us a bunch of money for uh, part of the shares of the business, okay. non-voting right rights, but it was enough money that, that me and PJ had never seen that kind of money before. And we were both like, we'll take this guy in. Yeah. Well, that guy and PJ got together and basically kicked me out mm. of my own business, um, which uh, they really couldn't do because I had 50% of the voting rights. And this is where like the American dream kind of gets messy, right? Yeah. Because you don't want, when you create a, a company, you know this, you put your blood, sweat, and tears into this thing. Yeah. And I was the one doing a large majority of the work. And uh, and then I ended up getting kind of kicked out yeah. of my own company. And it was a dramatic thing where I came to the office and and uh, the, the investor brought like like security guys who's worried I was going to freak out. And like they were like, God. Yeah, they were like, uh, be, be, this is literally what he said, get your shit and get the fuck out. Wow. And, uh, and I wanted so it, to, it was, bad. it was messy. It was messy. And when I left, I called my lawyer, this guy, Jonathan Bloom, and he told me, Aaron, there's, you can't get kicked out. You have 50% of the voting yeah. rights. There's no. So he said, take, take the day off, go home, relax, you know, and then tomorrow I'll go back to work just like normal and you're going to force him to negotiate. Mm -hmm. So I went back to, I actually hired an off duty cop I was friends with. And uh, me and Eduardo, my assistant at the time, we bought, we bought tasers <laughs> and, and just in case for self defense. <laughs> And we came back to the amazing. office and the next day and I sat down at my desk just like normal. I also, too, I think it's really funny that you're such a big guy uh -huh. and you say you got a taser for oh, self-defense. Yeah, I don't know. PJ is a big guy, too. I don't know what was going to happen. Um, so we went, right? And I sat down at my desk and just started working. And I was there at 9. PJ didn't roll into noon, which is typical. Yeah. Came in at noon and was like, what are you doing here? Get the fuck out of here. And I had Manny, the cop with me and, and Manny was like, sorry, he's not leaving. Like he, the lease is in Aaron's name, not in your name. If anybody's going to leave, it's going to be you. Yeah. And he was like, oh no. And like, he didn't know what to do. Got the cop there. Oh. We, he was going to get kicked out of the building himself. So he ended up calling his lawyer. And then because of this uh, kind of confrontation uh, at work, we started negotiating and I ended up getting bought out of the, bought out of the business. Yeah. And, uh, which was, was a blessing in disguise. Oh my God. Everything. So one thing about life that I've found for me, for sure. And I think probably for everybody else, if they are willing to look at it is that, is that when th bad things happen, it's an opportunity. It may not look like it at the time, uh, but there's, there's real opportunity mm -hmm. and disaster. And most people look back at the door that was closed behind them, uh, longingly back at, at the door, yeah. Instead of looking for the open door and right in front of them. Mm. So if I look back at any of these bad things in my life and I can literally go back and list them like this partnership dispute with PJ, which was terrible, because as soon as I it was done, it felt like I had lost a child. I mean, yeah, I put all this work into a company that now I have nothing to do with. And it felt in a way like a failure. It felt like it felt like, uh, and like personalities like ours sure. do not do well with no, not having it felt, perfection. It was it was it was it was a lot. It was a lot to handle. And so, you know, I was like and I don't get really get depressed. I don't get sad too much, um, fortunately. Uh, but I had a, about two days. Uh, the first day, the first day that that this all went down, I was I was I was sad. You know, I was like mm -hmm. legit sad. Probably drank too much. Next, Shocker. Yeah. Next day. Next day. Uh, I spent the next day thinking like, what am I going to do? You know? And, uh, one of the PJ's texts, I always remember, he goes, you have money now you saved the money. Just go relax on the beach and be with your family. You don't have to work now. Hmm. And I was like, motherfucker. Cause that's the exact opposite of, you know, that, that's your not what I wanted to do. I don't relax on the beach. Like, that's not... so I had that day of being like, huh, what do I do? You know? And then I, and then I thought about it and I said like that night, that second night, I was like, I'm going to do another supplement company. It's going to be way better than Blackstone and I'm going to make that idiot eat his words and I'm going to show everybody what I'm going to do next. And so the next morning I woke up super pumped and uh, started hiring people and mm. uh, going looking for offices. And uh, one of the things that I did with the the actual so this is like right after I left, got kicked yeah. out. Right. And it took a few uh, about a month or so to actually close the deal and mm -hmm. have me no longer part of the business. Um, but one of the things I, I negotiated for was a, a direct compete. Because usually when you get bought out, there's You've a non-compete. Non -compete. Right. Um, but he, he was such a cocky dude that I was able to appeal to use my lawyer, even though his lawyer was like, no, 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 no. I actually had a compete. So mm -hmm. in my agreement, in, the, in our separation agreement and then the, me being gone, was that I was going to directly compete against the brand. And so that was like, uh, that was all the motivation I needed. Yeah. And, and that's how Redcon one got started. Now, where it gets messy is in 2000. So that was 2016. Redcon takes off. Uh, we did in the first year, uh, in our, our very first, it was not even a year, we were doing over a million dollars a month on the, on the website. We were, you know, it was wow. a $15 million business within, you know, part of the first year. 
That's um, insane. And so, you know, with, within the next year, the following year, we were doing more in, in year two than Blackstone ever did financially in revenue. Yeah. And then now we do more in a, in a, in a month than they did, Blackstone did in their best year. Yeah. Um, but that's not where the drama, st- the drama begins now. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. now the real drama begins. Yes. And this is, in a way, how we got connected. Yeah. I guess your story, which I'll get into that after. Yes, but yes. State now what happened. The fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So in 2017, Blackstone Labs gets raided. I'm not there anymore. I have nothing to do with it by the FDA looking for these supplements that we don't make anymore. Mm-hmm. They don't find anything. And uh, they came over, the FDA came over to my office after and gave me subpoenas for all kinds of emails and stuff related to Blackstone. And at the time, I was like, well, this can't have anything to do with me. I mean, yeah. I'm not there. There's These products aren't made. Uh, I don't even, at that time, I didn't even know what they were even looking for. Because mm-hmm. um, they weren't like transparent with me. They didn't say like, hey, this is what we're doing, blah, blah, blah. They said, hey, we want you to come and interview and do, talk uh, talk with us. I'm like, no, 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 no. I know enough, about, I know enough about that to say, and I'm going to have to talk to my lawyer first. Yeah. Um, and I got a criminal lawyer. I was told that uh, I wasn't a target. And we kind of forgot about it. It was like, uh, I, I, I kind of just like, went about living my life and yeah. instead of trying to you be, thought oh they just want to question me see what i, I know. know that's it i didn't even i really um once the lawyers talked to them and they told them i wasn't a target or at least that's what my lawyers told me i was yeah. like oh nothing to really worry about like i'm not gonna redcon was so exciting at the time and we were building so quick quickly and rapidly i wanted to i did my best to focus all my time and energy on that yeah um and family of course uh but i um I'm good at compartmentalizing. So there was always a concern. Like there was always in the back of my head. Oh, I say I've got the art of, I've mastered the art of compartmentalizing. That's good. That's good. It's really good. It's terrible. It could also be bad. It's awful. It's a very toxic trait, but continue. But it could be good. I mean, I feel like a lot of my success has been because I've been able to look at during this period of time, I created a humongous company and did all kinds of cool stuff because I was able to compartmentalize. If I would have been like most people, I would have been... Uh, the stress would have killed me. Yeah. And at the end, stress did did definitely, you know, my compartmentalizing broke down and that's where compartmentalizing can be bad. Yeah. Because it's still, that stuff's still there, even if it's in the back, it's mm-hmm. still percolating back yeah. there, ready to come out at the worst moments. This episode of Unlocked is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening to me talk, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, national average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June of 2022 and May of 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. So So you got served with these subpoenas. You got in touch with your lawyer. Touch with the lawyer. You're not a target at this not point. Under, I, at least, though. I mean, I was, but I didn't know. Yeah. Um, hanging out, doing my thing, everything going good. 2019, I'm at uh, my chiropractor's office. I remember all this stuff really detailed, right? Yeah. And you I started getting phone calls. Every detail yeah. when so something put, is traumatic I'm happens. telling you. I'm telling you. Unfortunately, I don't remember all the details when the good stuff happens. You know, I wish I would remember more of the details of the good stuff. Um, so I put my I put my phone on all my stuff out of my pockets on the on the counter. And while he was doing like adjusting, the phone kept vibrating and vibrating and vibrating. And I get a lot of messages normally, but nothing like this. Something was going on. And I remember him doing it. And I remember thinking something bad. Like I felt like something bad and something mm. something's going on bad. I didn't know what it was, but I felt like something bad is going on. So as soon as we finished, I looked at my phone and I hadn't talked to my lawyers in like a year. Then text me nothing in like a year. And I had all these calls from the lawyers call and texts like, call me right away, to, you know. So as soon as I got out there, I called them and I felt like obviously something bad's going on. And they're like, hey, we just got noticed that uh, from the DA's office, from the DOJ, that they're, you're federally indicted. 
and that they want you to turn yourself in tomorrow morning um, at the courthouse and they're going to fingerprint you. And and I'm like, well, what am I charged with? And like the charges are all sealed. So we don't know exactly what they are yet. What? Yeah. And so I had to call my wife and, you know, I, and obviously that went from me not being like, you know, not even trying not to even think about it to being like a, an enormous deal. Well, the next day I had to go. Well, yeah, because when a federal indictment comes down, you yeah, the fight good. starts and everybody knew. So they obviously they publicized that DOJ puts out, you know, on on Google and now everybody knows because and you have a successful business. So. Everything. Yeah. Well, they made a big deal about it. And the accusations when that came out looked terrible. It looked like I was selling steroids and I was laundering money and I was wiring illegal money and I was this kingpin like I, I was like the walter white of steroids is what it looked like for real <laughs> you read this and you're like holy shit this is a bad dude i read it i'm like this is me white. that's amazing right. and, and uh and then when you go to court they say united states of america versus aaron singerman and you're like that's the worst you're like, most defeating feeling in the world and plus like me being me like i love america and like so like i don't want to be the first america you yeah. know like it's a very uh it was very like it was a bad feeling, obviously, the feeding feeling, like you said, and uh, and it was confusing. It was very confused, also because I didn't know, I didn't understand how it went from not a target and everything's okay to like now you're indicted and there's like a million charges and they read it to you. First off, they were nice enough not to break down my door and arrest me. Thank God, I was yeah. uh, that would have been bad because I know that happens. You know where you, they literally drag you in and the whole thing. Oh, I've happens. heard awful yeah. stories about that. Mom I've, and Dad were in your same position of thank God. being able to go and just. Yeah. Go in, do what you need to do, come back out. Yeah, that that and it's funny because it's that process was so like not bad that I was like, oh, okay, legal system like that. Well, it was not bad. Like they didn't like but then that's like not reality at all. No. It's so horrible. And no. that was like but I went in there, I fingerprint, and then I get in front of the judge and they read off all the charges and uh and then the the time that you could have for all, each one of these charges. And like my mom, my, you know, the people that I brought with me, obviously my wife and a few other people and everybody's crying. And like, you're hearing the, the numbers and you're like, cause Cause it adds up. Life. Yeah. Well, it adds up. And also, you don't, you know, obviously it happens uh, concurrently, which is the thing, you know, it sounds consecutive, like, yeah. like five years, 10 years, 10 years, 15 yeah. years, 10 years, five years. And you're like, uh, when, when we, when we, I remember when we uh, walked off, my mom was like, so he can go to prison for the rest of his life. And the lawyer's like, no, 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 not for no, They were not going to charge it like that. They won't be all. And it's like it was just like a lot to hear, you know, yeah. all these all these charges. And one of the things that they do uh, strategically is they give you lots and lots and lots of charges, as much as they could give you, so that you plea, so that you plea, because it sounds so scary. And then they can pull them off little by little, yeah. one by one or whatever. And if you're left with one, you're like, wow, I had, you know. You know, that would be the pitch, right? Yeah. Well, Savannah, we have 10 charges. You can go to jail for 20 years or you can plead guilty to one and it's a five year max. Yeah. You go, oh, one sounds a lot better than 10. Right? So you think you're like, oh, shoot, yeah. I'm getting a deal. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a scare tactic. Um, and then also if you go to trial and we talked about this, if you go to trial and you just lose one, it's big. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's and big the deal. conviction rate is what? 97, 98 percent. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. So. This happens, um, and then I continue. I there's obviously a big period of time, especially because COVID hit. Yeah. So my trial kept getting moved back and moved back and moved back and moved back, and so indicted in March of 2019, and I ended up going to prison in January of 2022. Um, January, like the very beginning of January. And to your experience was I pled guilty also. Yeah. I didn't go to trial. No. Thank God. Because you. I feel like with the way that your case happened, it's you. Part of you wanted to go to trial because you wanted well, I to planned show. On it. I planned on going to trial. Yeah, planned you planned on it. on it, but then you also were hit with you have a wife and kids, and the way the government scares you, they just do. So you're like, well, it's shoot. Very, it is there is it is very scary because when you contemplate going to trial, you know there's and if you testify, mm -hmm. you you're you get additional charges, and I mean obviously. You know, when most people go to trial, they get uh, knocked over the head big time. So if they were to plead mm -hmm. and you got, you, you know, you could plead and get three years, you go to trial and you can get six, seven years. Yeah. It's, it's always so it's uh, 
there is definitely a penalty and the government gets mad and like you're they're mad because you're making them work yeah and that's one of the things that i that i in prison you really find out i had a guy in prison uh that your dad i'm sure knows um who was a a, a guy there who i guess i'm jumping too far ahead you're of the jumping story. too oh, far stop, ahead of the sorry. story you go, you're go, ruining go. it oh never mind okay the big reveal sorry. yes so you pled yes. and then when from that point like what date was that and then what date did you go to prison so um so okay what what happened was i changed my plea and when i changed my plea that's when like so in my brain in my compartmentalizing brain right yeah i just i always thought i was gonna win i always thought i'd be okay i told yeah. everybody i'd be okay I, I mean it was like i i i believed it so much that i sold people left and right on it i had a private equity company come in and buy 24 percent of redcon mm -hmm. and i and I, I, you know, it's almost like I, now it's like, I feel like I pitched them, but I believed so much that I was going to be okay, that they believed oh, he's going to be okay. Yeah. And th this is a safe investment, although they did, they're doing just fine with their investment. <laughs> yeah, they're but doing fine. They're doing fine. But I, I believed it so much that, that everybody else believed it. Yeah. Uh, that I'd be okay. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. I tell everybody. And then when I changed my plea, I realized there's no way to pretend I'm going to be okay anymore. Mm. And that's kind of when like, like my compartmentalizing failed and I started feeling just, I'd wake up in the morning with this tremendous anxiety, like pressure on my chest. Because you truly start counting I'm, down the days. Counting down the days. Also, there's, 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 there's a level of, this is the, one of the biggest things with human people in general is when there's uncertainty, it messes with people. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of uncertainty because you don't know what it's going to be like in prison. You don't know mm -hmm. how long you're going to go for. You don't know, like, you don't know. And I had a judge that was famous for not allowing people to turn themselves in. Mm. So he doesn't allow, he, he makes you remand you. He remands you. So as soon as you lose, you get taken to county jail and you go through the process and then you go to a federal detention center and then you go from there on a bus mm -hmm. or a plane con air or a bus to another federal detention center yeah. to, to your final destination so um yeah i uh so was it the moment you pled guilty you were taken no 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 thank, thank i mean that probably would have been better in retrospect but when <laughs> i changed my plea to guilty then they have they do a sentencing at the sentencing you mm -hmm. leave immediately mm -hmm. most people they get their sentencing and then they give it time to get their affairs in order and report to yeah. wherever they're which is what is. mom and dad yeah. were blessed with thankfully I mean, thankfully so um so anyway i changed my plea and then i man i i had this anxiety and i'm not like i said i'm a happy person i'm not like i don't really get depressed i don't have anxiety i mean it feels like i have it now but i never i don't like have had to not have anxiety issues, but I would wake up like for the moment I'd wake up, I'd be like for a minute, for like a second, I'd be like, oh, oh all good. And then yeah. all of a sudden I would like crush me. Yeah. And, um, and my a poor decision was that I medicated myself with alcohol. So I wouldn't get like drunk, but like, you know, in the evenings I would start <laughs> drinking more yeah. and the anxiety would go away. When I was at work, I would be distracted because I went, I went to work every day, even after I played guilty. And I went to the gym every day. But as I got closer and closer to going to prison, um, I drank more and more um, so that it would it would remove Numb. anxiety. Yeah. It would, and so what it, literally I would drink, like do like a shot of vodka and then the anxiety would recede a little bit. It would still be there, but it would recede. And then it would start coming forward and forward and then I'd do another one and so on and so forth. And as a result of that, I made stupid decisions. I took uh, friends of mine out on my boat uh, at night and I crashed yeah. my boat. I went to went to jail for crashing my boat, which is when you're already pled guilty. It's pretty bad to to do that. Yeah, you know? doesn't look good. And so I went to county jail for that, and I, I hit my head, and it was a whole another thing, and that was all in the news, and everybody reported on it, and uh, of YouTube they videos, did. and you know, I think you know, unfortunately, America, as much as America loves a comeback story, they sure love to see people fall from grace. I've literally always yeah. said they love to build you up just to tear you down. Well. Yeah, I experienced that. Uh, I experienced that where people were, you know, they loved it. They thought mm -hmm. it was so cool that that this guy that yeah. uh, that that they were that I was disintegrating. I was yeah. falling apart. And so um, right before I was going to turn like three weeks before I was turning myself in, I had started taking Ambien and I crashed the car, took Ambien. And at night, uh, got a fight with my wife, went downstairs after taking it to uh, at a hotel in Miami. Uh, thinking I would go down and get food and like she'd be asleep and I'd come back and I'd be able to go to bed. And I'd never taken any of them before and I ended up driving the car and like into a tree or something. 
Dear and, God. And so, like, this is that's when they they remanded me. Uh, that's why I said it probably would have been good if I would have just, just went gone. The beginning. Then. Yeah, it's tough, man. It's really tough. That's a t- super tough period of time talking to all the prisoners that I now know, all the guys who have dealt with this. That period of time is really tough, mentally mm-hmm. really tough. Because you have to start letting go of everything that you're leaving and yeah. everyone, yeah. which is really tough. And two, so you, from the moment you were taken into custody, because you didn't get to self-report at that <laughs> point in time, yeah. you were in a bunch of different institutions. Yes. And what were the differences between those <sighs> until the moment you got to FPC Pensacola, yes. where dad's at? Sure. So um, when I when I initially went in Mm -hmm. um you go to county jail initially they have to book you through the county jail system and then you go from there to the federal detention center so the 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 worst part of it was that i went during covid i mean you know covid was like pretty much over it wasn't over at all for them yeah so when i got to county jail you have to go to a quarantine and Mm -hmm. so what they do is they bring you to a cell where they close the door and you're with one other person and um you have to sit it out basically for 14 days and they let you out uh, twice a week to shower uh, for 15 minutes to shower and uh, they bring a phone to the cell so you have one 15 minute phone call uh, a day and you just sit there and uh, I sat there for a few days before I got books and then I just read books like nonstop. and I had the good fortune of having a, a initially in the first county jail a guy didn't speak English which that sounds like that sounds like that'd be bad, but some of these guys uh, that were in these cells, I could hear them because it's 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 you know a big unit and there's all these doors all around the sides and two floors yeah. of it tiers, and you could hear guys who like sing or rap or like nonstop talking or kick the door. That's one of the things that people will kick the door over and over again trying to get the guard's attention. And so like my guy was like calm. He didn't really talk to me. Yeah, he just slept a lot, read his Bible, and like left me alone. Um, That's like if I would have got, it was, it was a blessing. Cause if I got one of these dudes who was like nonstop rapping and kicking the door, I don't know what would have happened. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know if I would have been able to make it without being some sort of violent encounter or, or yeah. losing my mind. Yeah. Um, so you sit there for 14 days and the problem was for me is they kept moving me. So every time you get moved, you start over quarantine again. So, no. so I'd be there for like seven, eight days They'd shift me to another one. And then I'd start quarantine again. There for three days, four days, I should meet another one. Can you, you do the quarantine again? And then when I finally got to, so when I when we left, when I was in county jail, everybody would say like, when you get to the feds, when you get to the, they call it the building in Miami, yeah. uh, the federal detention center in Miami, uh, FDC um, Miami. They're like, it's a five star resort. You're gonna love it. It's great. Food's better. Everything's better. More respectful people. And I was like, oh, I can't wait to get to the building. Like, yeah. You know, that's why you know, I was actually looking forward to getting there. Yeah. And then I got there and it was horrible. It like was horrible. what a misconception. That's the thing. Oof, it was so bad. Yeah. Okay. So you got there. I got there. And of course I went right back to quarantine. Yeah. Uh, and so they bring you up to, I was in the 11th floor called G unit on the 11th floor. And uh, I was with very lucky again. I got a rabbi who was my, was my cellmate. Uh, this guy, Yosef Tillis. Okay. Nice guy. We had a lot of great conversation. But the first 10 days I got there, there was gang violence in Beaumont, Texas. So they shut down all federal prisons completely on total okay. lockdown. So I was on this lockdown uh, unit. Uh, I would already be locked down in quarantine, but at least during quarantine, they let you out for some period of time every day. But for the first 10 days there, I wasn't able to leave the, at all. So we didn't get to wash our clothes or have underwear, new underwear or a toothbrush wow. or a shower for 10 days. And so we're literally locked in this cell, me and him, for 10 full days without getting out one time. Um, and it was like, you know, it's about as bad as it gets. And you get very little food. I actually, um, just to give you an idea, I was 255 when I came, when I went to jail initially. Okay. By the time I made it to Pensacola, I was 212 pounds. Okay. So I starved. Okay. I starved. Um, That's awful. Yeah, I, was, I literally starved because usually guys get commissary. Um, but uh, in the building and in county jail, I was never there long enough to get commissary. So I just had the very bare minimum food. Like for breakfast, you get two pieces of bread, dry cereal. Uh, and like a thing of milk and maybe a piece of fruit. That's like your breakfast. And then lunch is bologna sandwich or something like that. And then uh, dinner is some uh, some other like, you know, something small. And so it's about 1,200 calories. For a big guy, you know, you lose weight quick. So, Was there um, anything of nutritional value that you were receiving? 
Not much, not much, not until you get to Pensacola uh, when it got better, you know, but... Um, but you were still, like... I lost a lot of weight. I was starving. I, I told you uh So, when earlier. you got to Pensacola... Yes. Were you... And, too, what people don't realize is, like, when you get to... You were now at the lowest security facility yes. you could possibly be at. Yeah, and other places, like you mentioned, the building is a, is a high level. It's, like, a basically a penitentiary type... Because it's everybody, everybody, uh -huh. you, could, you know, you could be a, a murderer, a rapist, you know, you could be a really, really bad, violent guy. Yeah. And, I, and I saw violence and I was around that in those places, um, whereas Pensacola is a camp and in the camp, they don't tolerate any violence at all. There's mm -hmm. no I didn't in Pensacola for the entire time I was there. I never saw one fight. I heard about stuff happening where guys would go to the bathroom and kind of like settle, settle beefs. Yeah, but it was like. I didn't see anybody ever get beat up yeah. or anything like that. And too, when you get to the camp, there are no cells. No, there's no cells. There's no, there's, there's gates, but there's no barbed wire, no razor wire. It's, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to leave, they'll let you leave. Like if you, if you wanted to walk out the front door, nobody's going to stop you. Yeah. Now you'll end up getting five or 10 years more prison time um, mm -hmm. if, when they catch you and yeah. they will, but you could just walk out. Um, it's, it's, uh, when I got to Pensacola prison camp, when I got FPC Pensacola, I felt like I was, I wanted to get out of the bus cause you're chained in the bus and stuff. Uh, you're shackled. It's really terrible. It's the worst, the, probably one of the worst parts was the 15 hour bus ride being shackled from, oh. uh, from Miami out there. So, uh, to Tallahassee and then I stayed at Tallahassee a little bit and then the bus ride. Anyway, so the, uh, the when I got there, I literally wanted to kiss the ground. I felt like I was in the promised mm. land driving through those gates and seeing everything and seeing prisoners walk around on their own and like like the whole thing. And then seeing that there was a weight pile because that's why I wanted to go to Pensacola in the first place. They had weights. Yeah. I requested to go to Pensacola. Yeah. Um, and because um, in federal cases, what people don't realize is you can request. Yeah. And you we also now under federal law, you have to be within 500 miles of right. your family. Yes. Part of the new laws. Um, all that stuff, like the, all the Trump stuff that he brought on. He was the only president that's ever done anything for prisoners. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the First Step Act, which the Democrats, First Step Act, so. I have said, regardless of anyone's political beliefs and opinions, Democrat, Republican, whatever it may be, First Step Act was a huge, huge oh, yeah. win yeah. for people within our prison system. Mm -hmm. Because now when you're served with 12 years, you're not serving 12 years due to the First Step Act and all the classes you can take, credits you can earn, things yeah. of that nature. Yeah. And so what would you say when you, so you got to Pensacola and you were like, okay, this is, I've made it. Except they put me back in quarantine again. <laughs> but then after that, oh. I had 14 more days of quarantine, uh, but the quarantine was nowhere near as bad. You're in this place called D dorm, which is segregated from the rest of the okay. dorms. And uh, it, it really was the, even though it was another 14 days and I was super bummed because I was so excited to be there mm -hmm. than to be told like you're going back to quarantine again. It was tough, but yeah. As soon as I got out, you know, things were much, much better. Okay. And so what would you say? Because clearly Pensacola has been labeled as Camp Cupcake. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that. It's 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 got all the things. It's got a swimming pool. It's got a <laughs> golf course. It's got Oh yeah. You know, is that the truth? No. No, none From of that's the From someone truth. who actually served there. No, no, that's not the truth at all. Uh it is uh Look, it's it's a, a warehousing of of people. Yeah, that's really you're warehousing these guys. There's no rehabilitation going there. The the classes, quote unquote, classes are a joke. Nobody cares. And there's no like. There's no nobody's actually trying to help you get better. There's no there's none of that. Well, there had to because you did work and I was in education and the education department. Yes. So there had to have been some level of it that was rewarding to you. To me, like being a tutor, educational like tutor, being able to no. help. No, because nobody wanted any help. There was no real help to be given. I mean, there's people sign up for the classes to get the credit, but they don't actually like there's not there's not like real teaching going on. Like I didn't have like I had classes, but like they just want to they didn't get give their you, credit and go. Did they give you the proper tools, I guess, to do not it? Not really. You play videos for the guys. So yeah. like I really liked the world uh, world at war. So that was we did World mm -hmm. War Two, but I just played the video and then that's kind of it. Like people yeah. watch it or don't. I watched them, but people don't really watch them. And they're just sitting in there, you know, killing time to get their credits. So, yeah. no, I don't I don't think there's any level of um, rehabilitation whatsoever. I think you just, ha reha you know, you're housing people. And so they give you a, uh, a recidivism score uh, yeah. when you go in there. And, uh, and that's your chances of 
basically what your chances are of ending up back in prison. Yeah. Yeah. And so if there's guys like me where the score, my score is zero. So yeah. like if you're, Same stat. yeah. So if you're a first time nonviolent offender um, and you've never been in prison before and you're of a certain age, I think anybody over like 38 or 40, and there's a, a bunch of these factors that they look at, you know, your history, you have a family you know, and they, and they factor this all out. Uh, and then you get a score. So my my question would be, if you don't have a chance of recidivism, like for me, it's really impossible because the products that I we made, we discontinued years yeah. and years ago. So if your chances are zero and you pay your fine, so I paid my fine in cash. I owed $2.9 million and I paid it before I went for sentencing because mm -hmm. my lawyers told me that if I paid it, I'd get a way lesser sentence. My co-defendant, my business partner, PJ, did not pay it at all. We got exactly the same sentence. So it didn't. So, no, it didn't do anything. But yeah. But if you don't know, like if you've, if you have, if you've done like, or if you, they want you to have a chance to pay it, obviously if you're in prison, you can't pay it. No. Uh, you can't do anything with that. And, and whatever jobs you're providing, whatever thing yeah. you're doing for society, whatever you're doing for your family, those are all gone. Um, and now you have a person that you're warehousing that, um, that is a no longer a productive member of society. And if you have given them a score of zero, probably they were a productive member of society. Yeah. So what are we doing here? Like, so, what is the point? And obviously, a lot of these people have money that they yeah. have to pay, fines, restitution, whatever it may be. And what reentry programs or development programs does the facility offer for when you get out? Because you've got guys in there that oh, have yeah, served terrible. 10 years. It's terrible. And they get out. It's terrible. And what do they do? No, And so, so this is the thing that people don't understand is that it's not, it, it goes even further than that because before you go in, you know, you basically the, 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 not just the government, it's almost like the world kind of tries to destroy you. So you lose your bank accounts, you lose your ability to have a credit card, you lose your, I lost uh, insurance policies, my umbrella policy for my cars, my house, everybody drops you from everything. My credit for my business, my credit card processor got dropped. Everybody, everybody dropped me Every, from everything you can imagine said, I don't want anything to do with you because you're accused of a crime. So that's before you're even guilty. This is all happening. And obviously there's news about you. Same there's thing accusations. happened with me. I mean, I wasn't even involved in my parents' stuff and Chase Bank dropped me and said- Because your like, reputational risk. Yeah, I could be caused reputational damage to their company. It's crazy. It's yeah. crazy. So this happens to you immediately. And I don't think people have any idea, but there's also the reputational damage that's done for you that, that that's happening on the internet you know yeah people are talking you're getting news stories about it um so now when you google my name i you know my reputation is very important to me you know i'd spent a lot of time and effort creating a really great reputation in business yeah and now you google my name and the first page is all bad stuff mm -hmm. you know and uh, unfortunately on google bad stuff ranks higher than good stuff yeah um yep and that's part of their algorithm. They love bad news. People love bad news and they know it's going to click more. It goes up higher. And then the BOP, I'm sorry, the BOP, the DOJ stuff, anything from a government website is going to rank very high. Yeah. So you're getting your, your life is being, you know, essentially annihilated. And I was very, very lucky. Like your parents are very lucky to have created enough success that you have resources that you can, you know, combat this stuff. Yeah. You can fight it. You can fight it. So if you don't have resources, like almost everybody, you know, you can't, you can't operate a business anymore. You don't have bank accounts. You can't, uh, you no longer have the ability to fight the government because you don't have money to buy, pay for a lawyer. Yeah. You know, it, there's all of these terrible ramifications for an accusation. Yeah. And then when you plead guilty or lose a trial, it happens all over again. Yeah. So whatever chances you had before you went in, all your, whatever, your, your savings, your nest egg, your, 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 your capital, your, your, your reputation reputational capital is gone. Yeah. So then you go to prison and when you come out of prison, you're way worse off. And now you're a convicted felon. Nobody wants to hire you. Mm -hmm. You can't get a bank account now because you're a convicted felon. Um, and you're reporting for probation. Uh, you may not have a car. You may not have a license. Whenever you're drug tested, that interrupts whatever job you possibly could have. Some of yeah. these guys get drug tested multiple times a week. And if you're getting drug tested, you have to report to get drug tested from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. So basically during your work day, you must leave your work to go get tested. So now you have a job that you had to tell them, hey, I'm a convicted felon. I just got out of prison and now I'm going to have to leave work a few times a week in the middle of the day to go get drug tested. So these guys chances are like, how are they going to like figure it out? How are they going to build a rebuild a life? Mm -hmm. And so and that's the thing is it's so much easier to identify the problems than it is to 
find and implement the solutions to it. And so people don't care, unfortunately, what we're talking no. about until you're affected directly by it. That's what we've said. And, and I, I, I personally would have said the same thing. I thought DOJ was the good guys. Yeah. I thought Department of Justice is justice. I never knew that a prosecutor wants to win at all costs. I thought that if you were to go in the system and they would realize you're a good person, you'd be all right. Yeah. Um, and that's not the case. No, unfortunately, it's not the case. And with your, if you could brainstorm with the reentry process, because obviously it is a very broken mm -hmm. process right now, what would you say are some things that could be implemented within the system to mm -hmm. help with that reentry process? Because regardless of what people want to believe, people that are getting out of prison, they're going to be your neighbor. Yeah. So why not encourage this re-entry in a healthier environment than what's being given now? Well, there's a few things. First thing is uh, there should be sentencing reform. The sentencing guidelines are crazy. I've said crazy. that. It's yeah. crazy. It's crazy stuff where you got guys that I met who are great people. So, look, there's three types of people in prison. There's people that didn't do it at all. There's, there's probably 20% that didn't do it at all. Yeah. There's another 30%. Well, you that, know what the number is of what's been reported. What's been reported. One out of 20 criminal cases result in a wrongful conviction. Yes. And I would not be shocked if that was not higher. Oh, you also think about where, where we're talking about. Now you look at in a, in a camp like situation. Yeah. I, I think 20% of the people in my guess didn't, didn't do anything. I yeah. think 30% of the people made a terrible singular mistake. Uh, where they made a mistake in their life and they admit it. I had people admit to me. I have a, one guy that's a doctor, a spinal surgeon, admitted he misbilled Medicare and he realized it and was scared to report, self-report and pay the extra money because he didn't know what was going to happen. He So he ignored it, fixed the fixed the billing problem, Yeah, never paid. He got audited years later and they found that he misbilled for a few years uh, and sent him to prison. Got 10 years in prison. Uh, spinal mm. surgeon. I, Ivy League educated spinal surgeon. And my thing is, is why and he's not, like, I did mess up. I messed up. Yeah. Like, why not pay the fine, though, and allow someone to be a contributing factor to society? Yeah. I don't know. It's a, it's, but this is, so there's that percent. And then there's 50% that belong in prison. Uh -huh. um, so it's, uh, I think the sentencing guideline stuff, like the doctor who got 10 years, that stuff is really, that's the most concerning thing where judges, even if the judges see, so they want to give leniency, a lot of times they feel like, well, if I go outside of the guidelines, you know, I'm going to bring scrutiny on myself. Mm -hmm. And so they don't. And um, and then some judges, you know, obviously just go by the guidelines, some go over the guidelines. Uh, and that's yeah. another thing that's weird is because you can get a great judge and the judge will like you know, be reasonable. Yeah. You can get a bad judge. This is all random. Same with prosecutor. You can get a prosecutor that looks at your case and goes, ah, I'm not going to prosecute. Yeah. And another one that goes, I'm a crusher. Well, that's what happened with ours. It took a couple prosecutors to finally say, we're going to prosecute. Yeah. So it's. And that's so up in the air. That's, yeah. That's scary where you can, where it's, it's literally the roll of a dice that you get a good judge or you get a bad judge, you get a good prosecutor or bad guys, mm -hmm. or you get a prosecutor who wants, who thinks you did something terrible yeah. and feels like, you know, it's their job to bring you to justice or yeah. you got another one that says, you know what, this is a mistake. This is an accident. Mm -hmm. um, and two, something that you touched on earlier to where you jumped ahead. Oh, sorry. You, or maybe we weren't recording at the time. I don't know. But you spoke about eating out of the trash can. That was my first time hearing about that. Yes. So you yeah. have to tell me what. Yeah. I was in F I was in FP FDC, uh, Miami and, uh, we were eating so little amount of food yeah. and, um, I was, we were star, I, me and Yosef, the guy I was living there with, uh, were starving. And so this is when they were letting us out just to go shower. Okay. And so we had uh, the opportunity, really, you, you didn't have to just shower. You could go use the computer or try to use the phone, but you only had a really short period of time, 30 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. So you had to kind of make a choice. Yeah. You're, you're going to shower, you're, you're only twice a week. So you're going to shower, you're going to try to use the phone, what are you going to do? And so me and him came up with a game plan that when I would go to shower and, and he was not showering, he would go through the garbage cans and get all the styrofoam trays that had food left in them and bring them back to the, to the room. And then when I, and then we were reversed on another day yeah. and I would do the, 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 the scavenging and he would do the showering. <laughs> and so a lot of guys would leave their collie greens because I was one of the lunch, like their, their greens, not yeah. everybody eat the greens. And so we would get all the greens and they would get, they'd leave their salt packets. So we'd salt up the greens and we'd eat the greens out of the, out, out of, of the, the trash can, out of the garbage, out of the other inmates that didn't eat. 
And uh, that's how hungry we were. And that's the level of desperation. And the crazy thing is my life, like pre prison, you know, I'm a successful business owner and yeah. I live, a, you know, I'm the boss basically. And, uh, what you don't realize it's like how you just get up and go to your refrigerator and oh, yeah, you go everything. to your pantry and like, you don't have that ability anymore. So you now know. you're sitting in a federal prison system and you're eating out of a trash can literally from 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 uh f- from a life of really i mean really luxury to be honest with you yeah um an unusual life yeah to an unusually unusually yeah. bad crazy uh crazy yeah. switch it was a very unbelievable like the juxtaposition of these two crazy differences is, mm-hmm. is a lot and that's one of the in, in my book that's part of the introduction that's what i brought up to yeah you. so what what's your book going to be titled my book is called raising uh redcon okay. and uh it's a, a business book uh slash memoir slash self-help book um, where I hope that I provide enough value, business advice and, and advice, life advice to create success, uh, help people create success mm-hmm. while avoiding the pitfalls that, uh, that I did. So it's, it's entertaining, but it's the idea is that it provides value and it's educational. For sure. So it's And different. when does it come out? June 27th. It okay. should have been April 25th, but. Uh, Stuff happens. Uh, uh, yeah. Stuff happens. So before we wrap up, I do want to touch on something yes. you posted on Instagram the other day. Yes. And I will say I saw it and I started crying because I was like, I can't wait for that day. Yeah. Um, and it was a video of you walking out of prison mm-hmm. and your little boy is running up to you. Yes. What? How would you describe that moment? So the hardest part of going to prison initially, uh, the hardest part was telling them that I was going to prison. It was mm-hmm. very difficult for me. That was part of the reason why I was drinking so much and yeah. felt the anxiety is because I, I have three little boys, Asher, Aiden, and Elijah, 10, 7, and 5. Uh-huh. And I have a very, the way I teach my boys, um, I'm, I have a very different parenting style. So I am raising little men. Yeah. And I teach them what it is to be a man and how to respect people and how to do what you say you're going to do. And we have a series of rules. We, the Singerman rules we go over and, um, and, and, and I have like a, a real style, oh. okay. a real style that I, that I do yeah. uh, with, with these guys that I'm trying to. And so it doesn't, uh, it doesn't comport. Like I can't, it doesn't make sense. I can't explain to them. I'm, I'm daddy is going to prison. It doesn't yeah. make sense. So I struggle. Cause you a lot didn't follow that. the rules. Right. Yeah. Always, yeah. I mean, the, that's in their the mind. Rules, where a lot of the rules, I, and I wanted to make it make sense to them so they could still like identify with the rules, and uh, you know, you always, did the best you could. Yeah. So, but I, it ended up being okay, and, and it, while they cried and it, they were upset, it ended up being okay. Um, getting out was was uh, so when you're in there, and I was in RDAP, which is the residential drug yeah. and alcohol treatment program, which allows you to get out earlier. Um, in the morning meetings, it was in the chapel, and every day I would try to sit on the side where I could see the gates, the mm. gates that go in and out of uh, Pensacola. And I, in the time that I was there, I never left. I didn't have a job outside because of RDAP, you can't leave. And so I would sit there in the morning, and I would stare at those gates, and I would imagine what it was going to feel like when I would leave the gates, like what it was going to be like. And I did it really like every day, pretty much sometimes multiple times a day or I would imagine. And then I had the, because I sat there and I was there at that time in the morning when they let prisoners go at eight, I would see mm. prisoners leave and reunite with their family. And I would always, lo- I would love it. I loved it. Like that was probably one of the the best, like the nicest moments in prison is seeing people leave. So I get to see them leave and I'd watch them, you know, hug their family or whoever it was, or even if it's just getting into their friend's car and leaving, I'd be like, yeah. Oh man, that's so awesome. I'd be super happy for people to leave. Yeah. And uh, and then even to, to see it happen was like a cool, like almost like a, a bonus. Yeah. And, um, and, and I would imagine what it was going to be like for me. So in the video I posted, and it took me a while to even put, I had that video obviously since December 1st when I got yeah. out of prison. But and too, was, we'll put it in the video on oh, YouTube for people it. to see. Yeah. It's a good, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. It's emotional. It was, it, it was, it's, it's so like, you know, like remembering it, even watching the video again, I didn't go back and watch it because it was like, there was so much going on in my head. And like my, my kids were crying. My oldest was crying really hard and you can hear it in the video. I'm crying. And I like, it was just a lot. They came with signs and I had a bunch of friends came and we had two, two SUVs picked me up. And it was like a, you know, it was a big, big moment. It was a big, big moment and a very emotional moment. And, uh, there's a look, there's a lot of things. It's a lot of things. Good things came out of going yeah. to prison. I learned a lot and I came out a better person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I know that I am, uh, 
a better father out of it, a better leader, you know, uh, a better business person, a better human in general. There's a lot of positivity to be taken out of it. Yeah. Obviously, when you're there, it's 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 hard to see that. But I, I told myself over and over again when I was there, like this is good. This is a good thing. Like yeah. there's something that there's a reason why I'm here. There's a reason that this is happening, and I'm going to take this experience for whatever good I can get out of it. I'm going to wring the good stuff out of it and come out of here better than I did. That's awesome. Well, I just have to say, I'm really proud of you Thank and you. I'm really blessed to know you and Thank you. you posting that video really, I will say I've had a really tough time and seeing that video, it gave me so much hope. Cause I was like, that day's coming. It's coming. Um, so just thank you. Of course. Yeah. Thank you for coming on my podcast. Of course. My pleasure. Thank you for sending me all the red con one. Of course. And I hope I didn't send you too much. I Grayson is in heaven. So <laughs> we're happy. Good. And so your book. It's happening. Yes. So, well, thank you. Thank you.